Live. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Mesa Public Schools Governing Board Candidate Forum. I'm Chrissy Lenz, director of the National Comedy Theater Phoenix in wonderful downtown Mesa, Arizona, and I will serve as this evening's moderator. Tonight's forum is completely virtual in accordance with CDC guidelines regarding large gatherings. Please join me in welcoming this evening's panelists, six individuals who are willing to donate a significant amount of time during the next four years to serve the district. They are Kiana Marie Sears, Rich Crandall, Joe O'Reilly, Vicki Johnson, I'm waiting for you to be on camera. There she is. Hi, Vicki Johnson. Laura Salomon Ellingson. <laughs> and Kara Schnepp Steiner. Nice to be here. Yes. Before we begin to review tonight's format, I will be asking the candidates a series of questions about topics important to our community. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to answer each question. Just prior to our event, the order in which the candidates are seated and will respond was randomly selected. Also, we will rotate who is the first to respond to each question. I'm sure many of you have questions of your own. Hopefully, they will be answered during this 90-minute forum. Once the formal portion of this evening is over, we will share contact information for our candidates so that you may reach out for, with your questions directly. So let's get started. Question number one, please tell us a little bit about yourself and why you chose to run for the governing board. Good evening, my name is Kiana Maria Sears and I'm a proud Mesa resident as well as I have been privileged to raise my kids here in Mesa. And with gratitude, I decide to continue this service as a Mesa Public Schools governing board member. For the last four years, we've gone through some challenging times, but we've also done great work to better the availability and accessibility for all students to thrive here in Mesa. That's my passion. That's what I'm dedicated to. Future success of all Mesa Public School students. I moved this to this community because of public education. And I am a proud, proud mom that sees my children flourishing in their adult life because Mesa provided a great education. And I want that available to all children, no matter what their economic level is, no matter what their race or creed is, it's all about what we can do to serve. And I'm here to serve despite these challenging times. I am dedicated, I'm a public administrator, and I am a champion for MESA and our schools and everything MESA stands for. So thank you for having me tonight. And it's my pleasure and privilege to continue serving. Thank you. Mr. Crandall. Thank you very much. About seven months ago, I emailed then Superintendent Andy Forless and asked her if I could have a brief conversation about her vision for the Mesa Public Schools. I told her I was thinking of running for the board again, but I would only do so if I could be a part of something big that made a significant impact on all students in Mesa. What was a scheduled 20-minute phone call turned into over an hour of the superintendent talking about her vision and equity and choice and accountability and innovation and opportunity. And at the end of this phone call, I said, that is a vision that I want to be a part of. And I threw my hat in the ring. My name is Rich Crandall, and I love the Mesa Public Schools. I had the opportunity to serve on the Mesa School Board from 2005 to 2008 with other great leaders like Mike Hughes, Lynn Burnham, Cindy Hobbs, and Elaine Miner. 12 of our 13 children attended Mesa Public Schools. We've been to three different high schools, five middle schools, six elementary schools. And I now have a granddaughter in kindergarten at Robson. Thank you, Mrs. S. And just today, another granddaughter uh, had an opportunity at the Student Services Center this morning for her first IEP evaluation with a speech therapist. 
I'm vested in the Mesa Public Schools, which may be one reason why I was recently endorsed by former superintendents, Jim Zaharis, Deb Duvall, and Mike Cowan, three individuals who made a huge impact on the Mesa School District, and I appreciate so much their support. I hope for your support on November 3rd, and thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Dr. O'Reilly. Thank you, and thanks, Mesa, for hosting us tonight. A little bit about my background. My wife, Carol, and I moved to Mesa after completing our doctorates at the U of A. And we moved to Mesa temporarily, or at least that's what we thought at the time. It wasn't long before we, got, we fell in love with the district and the community. And, um, and now, 30 years later, we're still here. We're still involved. I devoted a large portion of my career to the Mesa schools as a director of research and evaluation. And there I learned very thoroughly about our students' achievements, about the district's strengths and the district's challenges. During that, a few years ago, Mike Cowan got his call to go to the Dominican Republic. I too got a call at the same time, but it was Michael Crow asking me to come down the street and be the director of the Decision Center of, for Educational Excellence at ASU. Neither of us could say no, and, and that's where I am now. Uh, Mesa has had a couple of rough years since then. If 2020 wins the gold medal for the um, for the most disruptive year ever, 2019 earned the silver. In the process, we lost some of our community trust that's been the bedrock of Mesa schools. That was a call to action for me. I want to put my skills to work for Mesa to rebuild trust, to put students first, and to spend wisely. I believe that my experiences will complement the other board members as we have four probably challenging years ahead of us. I, talk, I was talking to a sixth grade class and talking about using math in my job. And one of the students came up afterwards and said, that time? Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Dr. O'Reilly, that is your okay. time for this one. But thank you very much for your response. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Johnson. Thank you. Uh, my name is Vicki Johnson, and I am a Mesa native. I went to, uh, to Washington Elementary Rhodes right. and graduated from Dobson, and then I did my uh, undergraduate work at ASU. I have two boys that are currently in the Mesa Public Schools. One is over at Westwood and the other one is at Steepley. So I'm very invested in the area and I will be in the community for a long time. I volunteered at their schools pretty significantly. I've been on PTO, SIAC, and worked in the classroom uh, quite a bit with their teachers. I'm concerned about making sure that there's parents on the board to represent our community. So um, as a board member, it's our job to make sure that the vision and the values of the community are represented with the school district. And I wanna be somebody that's able to do that for our entire community. I'm currently working as a physician liaison for my husband's business, and I go out to the community. I'm building relationships with other doctor's offices every day. Uh, the, before that, I was working in executive resolutions, and so I'm very used to trying to help resolve problems and, and rebuild trust in the community. And so I think that I would be a good match for our, for our board. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Ellingson. Hi, Christy, thank you for having us here tonight and the rest of Mesa Public Schools. And I wanted to thank the other candidates for being here as well. This is not an easy thing to do, to run in this campaign. And I, I thank them all for being here. My name is Laura Salmon Ellingson, and I love Mesa. I was raised here in Mesa. I am a product of Mesa Public Schools. I met my sweetheart in a Mesa Public School, and then we produced four little sweethearts who now go to Mesa Public Schools. So <clears throat> I, uh, we, we left for a little while um, while my husband was in school and military and came back because we wanted to raise our children here in Mesa. I have my bachelor's in early childhood education and my master's in curriculum and instruction. And so I've also taught for Mesa Public Schools and I've substitute taught for Mesa Public Schools. So I feel that I have a, a unique perspective in that I am a parent, but also a teacher. My four children range in age. I have a range from seven to 17 and also in abilities. I have a child who has an IEP. I have a child who is in gifted and talented. I sit and sweat at the track meets watching my son. I go to the choir concerts and the orchestra concerts, so I'm, I'm in it. I feel all the sides of Mesa Public Schools, and I would love to serve the community in this way. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mrs. Steiner. Good evening, and thank you for having us. My name is Kara Schneff Steiner. I am a Mesa native. 
Um, my husband and I were both delivered by the same doctor, and so was our four children here in Mesa. It's kind of an odd story, but it's, it's kind of a fun one, too. Um, I am a product of Mesa schools. I went to Longfellow, I went to Mesa Junior, and I graduated from Mesa High School. We have four children who also graduated from Mesa schools um, at Mountain View. We now have seven of our nine grandchildren who are in Mesa Public Schools at, at, at the present time. Um, I am a former teacher and a um, Title I specialist and a principal from Mesa. I retired from the principalship at Johnson Elementary, and um, I led them into the, to a Title I designation which helped provide many resources for us as a school. Supporting teachers and employees, the policies, and being innovative um, within the district is really a passion to be able to understand um, how to distribute that equity, how to make sure all of our students are learning. I think I offer a fresh perspective uh, and an insight focused on forward movement, especially in these trying times. So I appreciate being here and I think I'm a great candidate. So thank you for having us. Thank you. For question number two, we're starting with Mr. Crandall. How would you address and improve equity concerns for students and staff? Just over the last few years, this has gotten really personal for me as, uh, as I've been working on my doctorate degree up at NAU, finished my coursework, finished my exams, and it came time to do a dissertation. And when you do a dissertation, you want to pick something you're passionate about. And so I approached Chris Gilmore, the principal at Westwood High School, and said, I'd like to do my dissertation about why not every kid at Mesa schools are succeeding. For example, we know there's 3,500 kids approximately at Westwood High School. About 750 really love high school. They're engaged. They're in, in, involved. Another 750, eh, they go, they show up, they try at least. But then there's about 2,000 kids, 1,500 to 2,000, who high school's just, I show up, I sit in my seat, and I leave. And at the end of the day, my GPA is low. I don't have a, a, a post-secondary plan. So my dissertation has been focusing on what can we do for those kids. And the, more, the, the harder we, we dig, the more I dig, the more I realize we need flexibility. We need options. We have to meet those students where they are and not expect everyone to come to school uh, equal because it's not going to happen. And so what can we do to offer flexibility and options? Can we have school on Saturdays? Can we have it on evenings? Can we have abbreviated schedules for certain kids? Can we start CTE much earlier uh, in the program? Anyway, that's, uh, equity is not, there's not a one size fits all solution. And so as a board member, I would shoot for flexibility and options. Those would be my key words. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. O'Reilly. The Mesa Promise states that all students will be served by strength and deed. It doesn't say some, it says all. Providing equal opportunities and support isn't just implied by the promise, it is the promise. Our start, student outcomes indicate that perhaps we're not get all the way where we need to be. Our graduation rate has been going up, but still almost one in five are not graduating on time. And it differs. Whites and Asians have about an 88% graduation rate, African Americans 72%, special ed students 68%. That's not equity. We're not getting all students to the same high outcome. Um, if we look at our COVID response, we try to give everyone a computer. That's equal, but the outcome was not equitable. Students who were younger, who were learned differently, speak English language learners, needed the support to get to that, that level that they need to meet our outcomes. So that's our big challenge is meeting the, and delivering on the promise. And the board can relay that role in terms of setting policies, resource allocation, monitoring our goals for outcomes for all, and that's how we get to equity in Mesa. Thank you. Mrs. Johnson. I think that we need to take a good hard look at how we implement programs for equity. When we look at the schools that are Title I funded, uh, the Title I funding allows us increased uh, financial ability to support these kids. But the schools that are Title I, we only have nine that are A grade schools. And then we have the two that are the lowest um, 
with or the highest with free lunch and reduced lunches that we have are B-rated schools. There's two of them that we need to look at the programs and why those are working. And then how do we stretch those even further so that we can bring them up to the next level and then duplicate that. And I think a lot of the times we're looking at equity from do they all have the same items, but we need to look at do they have the same needs? And a lot of them don't. We need to reevaluate the programs to make sure that they fit the needs of that student. And that's something that I think is currently missing. We have choice schools that are fantastic, but the representation of our population isn't reflected in those choice schools. So making sure that they know that those are options. Uh, three of the nine schools are choice schools. And I think that we need to make sure that our entire community is has that accessible to them to use those to further their education and that they're aware of them. Um, I think that also just making sure that we're offering the right choice programs. If we need to look at different options or something that helps those communities to bring that bring a different change to it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Mrs. Ellingson. Uh, yes, like. Um, Dr. O'Reilly said, the MESA promise is an equity statement. Every student will be known by name, served by need and strength, and graduate ready for college and career and community. Are we serving all of our students by need? <clears throat> Every single school here in MESA Public Schools has its own challenge. And I, when I first taught for MESA, I had about six children who didn't speak English. They were English language learners. And what does that look like? And the dynamics of their culture and their family situation. Also, I have a child who's in special, has special needs. Are those children, are their needs being met? Right now, um, I think we could add more tier two interventions so that the students have more access to the curriculum. What does that look like? We have right now 20% of our district is in special education. And how, how are we meeting those needs? Is their education equitable? <clears throat> I think those are things that we need to take a look at when we're trying to decide how to help every student and serve every student and, and meet all of their needs. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Steiner. Um, I th would you your mic I think is not turned on no problem would you there like you to go begin? Yeah, would you like to you. begin again <laughs> <laughs> I was going to respond to um, Vicki Johnson's statement about um, how do we figure out how to have equity within um, the district and those Title I schools. I was a proud principal of a Title I school. We were number five out of 52 schools, elementary schools. We also were a grade A for five of the seven years that we earned that I was there. Um, and equity involves giving every student those specific needs of, of the specific tools um, to help them be successful. So we, I think we first have to recognize our own personal bias. We have to be able to overcome that. We have to embrace rather than shy away from helping those students and understand the unique backgrounds of those students and, and where they come for, from and making them understand how important it is that they're there. Um, I think there's deeper implications with the word and many of our other candidates talked, on, talked about that. It doesn't just reflect on um, our low economic students, our special ed students, our gifted and talented students, those with ILLPs, those with um, IEPs, 504 plans, they still need to have equity. Um, and we need to make sure that we are providing that to them. So I think we need to instill a growth mindset. We need to have, as educators, we need to maintain an awareness and a consciousness um, to model that growth mindset as well. So we need to instill those I can statements and understand the potential and ability of every student that we have. Thanks. Thank you. Mrs. Sears. Thank you so much for the opportunity. This is a question that's very important to me because I believe every child deserves to learn. And I think in order to accomplish this, we have to be more courageous and be honest and be transparent about what our data is, look at what our results are, 
they are reflected, as Mr. Arado said, we know that we have some challenges. We know that there's a disproportionate um, children of colors being dis disciplined in our district. We know that there's been push out. So when we look at all of those things, we have equity and we've embraced that as a pillar. We have to be courageous in executing programs to look at ourselves. Those caring adults that take care of children Yes, bias is something that we have to look at, and we have to have a growth mindset about changing how we approach children and how we create a system in which all children can learn and do this. Because sometimes we tend to just say, well, it's money, language, but it's also the culture, and part of the culture needs to change. And I can say that because I've raised two children in Mesa Public Schools that look like me. So I'm very aware. I'm aware of a lot of the issues that we deal with our Latino community. So it's important for us to be the community that cares about all children and do the right thing by all children, by being courageous, being honest, executing, and being transparent. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Uh, question number three, starting with Dr. O'Reilly. What is the biggest challenge facing children today and how would you mitigate its impact on student achievement? I think the biggest challenge facing students today is the learning loss that they've suffered because of the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, last spring, this fall, they've lost over 75 days of direct classroom instruction. Mm -hmm. So the, okay. they can't recoup that loss, but they, we may have to, we should reallocate our resources so that we can, we can help those students make that time up. That's, that's the biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I think, is what our focus needs to be as a board, as a district, uh, and schools and teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Johnson. Yes. I think that one of the biggest challenges that we currently have right now for students is the flexibility in teaching. Right now, there's a lot of teaching to the test, and I feel like that is one of the biggest struggles that we currently have, is we have amazing teachers that are very qualified to, to give out the information, and one of the hardest things to read when COVID hit was that the fourth quarter was focused on AZ Merit anyway, and that most of the new learning is over. And, and that was a hard pill to swallow when you saw that, and I think that we should be doing the learning the entire year trust our teachers that the test scores will come intrinsically. That if, if they're doing the right thing all the time, one of the math teachers that my child had made sure that she did weekly reviews every week so that they were prepared and they didn't lose any of that information as they moved on to new skills. And there's so many teachers with great ideas that I think are similar that would be able to help create that environment and give them more opportunities for uh, deep learning and critical thinking and going outside the box and more hands-on opportunities if we weren't as concerned about the test taking, it's a critical part of our budget, but that we need to trust that that's gonna come if we're doing all the right things all the time to begin with. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Ellingson. Thank you. You know, we have unique challenges because we have unique students. They're all individuals. Um, like Dr. O'Reilly said, I agree that learning loss is a huge challenge right now. Typically, um, a child going into third grade loses about 20% of their reading skills and 27% of their math skills this summer before third grade. And here we are seven months in to some sort of a different kind of education. So what is that going to look like for a compensatory education in the future, catching some of these children up? Right now, Mesa has a 79% graduation rate. How can we catch those kids who aren't graduating? Um, as citizens of Mesa, only 45% attain a higher education, um, secondary or a technical training. So where are we lacking and how do we meet the needs of our students? Also, another challenge is, are we listening to our community? How do we take the time to listen to um, parents and families and also teachers and their needs? Perhaps maybe some more committees or different things where we can be transparent to the public because I believe that we're, we're having some issues with unity. 
we need to come back together and recognize that all of this is for the students. We want the students to succeed. We want the students to be educated. It lifts us all when our community is educated. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Steiner. Well, I think at the present time, um, with the COVID and the virtual online learning, we have a digital divide within our communities. One of those is access, um, not only to, com to um, computer hardware, but also to connectivity and internet. So I think there, we're facing that, but I think the teachers have done a really, really good job. We do have some th students that are more engaged than others, um, and that focuses on what's happening at home and to help them, um, and some parents just can't if they're um, working and the students are home by themselves. So I think high engagement of students um, and the interaction, participation, where are they? Some of them don't even log on. I think that's a huge piece to the challenges for our students right now. Um, I think they also need to um, understand teaching and learning. Our teachers are resilient. So they're doing their best to track down those, those students. Um, our teachers are purveyors of knowledge and they work really hard to make sure that they do reach every student. So I think right at the moment, just because of the circumstances that we're in, that challenge for our students is that high engagement and it's a challenge for our teachers as well. How do we get them to make sure that they're engaged in all the learning that we want to offer them? Thank you. Mrs. Sears. I would say the funding model of public education. Currently, the funding model of public education stifles us in many ways. The innovation that we want to do with changing our models, looking at seat time versus number of days students attend, and all of that being attached to funding and the dollars we get keeps us from being as nimble as we could be when it comes to navigating and being innovative. We go to places like ACU and we go to think tanks to be able to understand the things that um, would help our students, but then we're restricted by legislation that keeps us from doing the things that would actually greater serve our students. Even when you look at addressing social emotional needs and all the things we want to do, okay, we're restricted again there with money and how we can move things around and where the money goes and what pockets it can come out. So the, I think the entire funding model is not just saying, okay, let's get more money, we need more money, but the model itself doesn't give us the autonomy to do the things to actually meet those needs and all the things that we want to do. I think we do a great job and we come up with the right paradigms, but the model has to change. And it takes change agents for public education to say our schools actually need new legislation. So as a public administrator, that's one of the things that I want to continue to be a voice for when it comes to public education. Thank you. Mr. Crandall. Thank you very much. The biggest challenge is that we don't have one big challenge. In today's environment, we have mental health issues, we have depression, we have suicide, we have lack of engagement, which means we need to adapt to that model. I wanna share a personal experience that's happened over the last two, three months. My son was going to be a senior at Mesa High School, and he lived for JROTC, Colonel Walker, Master Sergeant Caldwell. They knew how to engage kids at their level. He was going to be a senior. Well. He didn't do well in COVID. He doesn't do well with remote learning. And when, he, when it became obvious that ROTC was going to go online, that crushed his world. So I went to him about two months ago and I said, son, uh, I can't believe I'm going to say this as a, as a Mesa School Board candidate, but I think you need to drop out. I think you need to take the GED and I think you need to start the ROTC program at Utah Valley University in person live. And he said, dad, that's the dumbest idea ever. And I looked at him and said, well, we'll see. He called me two weeks later and said, Dad, I'm going to take the GED. I'm going to drop out and I'm going to start college. And, I'm, and so six weeks ago, my son started the in-person ROTC program at Utah Valley University. And two weeks ago, he's rappelling out of a helicopter at the Provo Airport. He's got history. He's got biology. He's engaged. He knows he has to keep his grades up. How do we meet that for a 17-year-old senior? How do we get that kind of engagement? Kids are different. We don't have one big challenge. We have numerous challenges. And I think we've got the skill and talent the Mesa District to meet kids where they are. Thank you. Thank you. For question number four, we're starting with Mrs. Johnson. 
The governing board is responsible for the district's budget. What are your spending priorities? I could spend a lot of time on this question. Um, <laughs> I'm really grateful that one of the priorities that Mesa's Public Schools has with the ASBA is requesting budget flexibility, because I think as things have changed, we're gonna need to be able to be more flexible and more adaptable. We need to look at the areas where we've been able to save money through COVID. We haven't had the paper expenses. We haven't had ink costs, um, gas for the buses. Uh, we need to look at how we can reallocate those funds instead of saving them and using them up later, we now have different technology areas that we can, uh, that we'll have to be funding. We got the one-time CARES Act where we could, from Mesa, that gave us the opportunity to purchase the laptops, but as they age out, we're gonna be adapted to a new model where kids are using them more, and that's gonna have increased expenses. So being able to look at what we can do with those funds. With the rainy day fund being depleted with the state, we're gonna have a challenge trying to get more funds into the classrooms through the state government. So we're gonna have to look at ways to, and make hard decisions in order to make sure that the right funds get into the classroom and to the students so that their learning opportunity is where, where the money is going. We've reduced our number of students that we have in our district since 2008, yet our significantly, we're almost 20,000 students under, um, yet our executive cabinet has increased. And I'm not saying that anybody doesn't have a good position there, but that's an expense that the district's taking on, and we need to look at if that's the best place to put those funds. Thank you. On to Mrs. Ellingson. Okay. So, I have never been on a school board before. I've never worked for on the district level. So being that I, but I am in charge of my own household budget. And I would look at the school budget or at, as the district budget similarly to that. First of all, if I don't have the money, I don't spend it. Also, sometimes I've had to shift funds when a child has had a hospital bill or we paid for tutoring for my dyslexic daughter. We've had to shift funds in order to meet the needs of our children. So for me, I wanna make sure that our hard earned tax dollars are going to benefit the children the most and getting into the classroom. When I was PTO president a few years ago, we would send out a newsletter once a month, sometimes every other month, telling the parents and families who had donated money to our school ways that we, what we spent their money on. I think that could be a great idea for Mesa Public Schools to send out maybe a quarterly report saying, I know that with the bond money, we have lots of school improvements coming. And I think as a taxpayer, it's nice to see where our money is going and be able to see that in a, in a visual, maybe a newsletter type situation. Um, also, I think that we can be smarter with the money. You can assess, you know, my air conditioning unit I know is about is old, so I know I need to replace it with the school. We can look at things like that. Too. Thank you. Mrs. Steiner. Um, where do I start? <laughs> I think, first of all, we need to look at aligning our budget priorities to what was communicated to our community during the override and bond elections so that they understand where that money should be going and is it really going there. We've spent a lot of money just on school safety, um, which is really imperative right now during COVID-19. So I think appropriate expenditures for cleaning and disinfecting, those personal protective equipment for teachers and students that we're, that we're helping um, also help, will help us return to a five-day week in person. But I think also preparing students for college and career in the community, like it said in our promise, in the portrait of a graduate, um, to hiring staff, to lowering class sizes so that we can social distance, so that we have those um, addition, that additional time for the teaching and learning. Um, one of the goals is that 90%, we have 90% proficiency in those tested levels, third, eighth, and um, 11th grade, and a 95% graduation rate. We're not nearly there. If we can lower class sizes, and also be able to spend those money to hire highly qualified teachers. I know we're in a teacher shortage, but 
um, I think that's a good direction to go. According to the National Center for Educational Statistics, Arizona's ranked 46th in the nation for teacher compensation. Thank you. That, that is all of your time. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, and on to Mrs. Sears. As a governing board member, you are um, elected to serve our entire community. So when you look at uh, the spending that happens with the district, one, having an abundance of appreciation for the override and bonds that were passed and a commitment to us saying we're going to do what we're doing, what, you know, what we say we're going to do with the money. So I would say, one, the community priorities, what the community voted for and what we said we were going to do, which I believe our budget very much aligns with that. And going deeper, and one thing we're fully committed to, the success of our children. So making sure that that money goes into all that makes a child successful. So when we look at the classroom, because a lot of people say we need more money into the classroom, when we look at the classroom, what are we doing in those classrooms? Where are we innovating to help children succeed? When you have from 28 to 30% of students not graduating, that's a problem. That's a huge problem. And our commitment is where are we as a community, as a school district, failing those students, and what can we do? So hence, that's why I'm here, that's why I'm willing to give the time to our community to bring my public administration skills and talent to um, continue the work to help us improve, because I'm grateful for all MESA offers, and I want it offered to all children. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Crandall. <clears throat> One of the benefits of the six individuals who are up here on the stand uh, tonight is various areas of expertise. We have educators, we have business uh, individuals, and that makes for a great school board when you have diversity. My area of expertise happens to be finance. I'm a CPA, I'm an MBA in finance. I got to serve on the Appropriations Committee in both the Arizona House and the Arizona Senate. And then I own a couple of companies, uh, large consulting firms with about 500 employees. So when you ask me what my spending priorities are, I, th I, I put all of those things together. And I think about where do you get the biggest bang for your buck? And with my, my companies, it's personnel, having the right people. And so one of the things I will focus on intently as a school board member is making sure we have the right people in the right places throughout the school district. You can't have a great school district without great teachers and administrators. And speaking of administrators, I appreciate so much uh, the Auditor General is very vocal about the Mesa School District and how, despite what some people may think, our administration rate is below the national average and below the state of Arizona average. That's something that we can be very proud of in Mesa. Uh, I do think that one of the things that I would do, just like with my private companies, is develop partnerships, strategic partnerships to help stretch those funds. We've got the city of Mesa, who's been a great partner for us, Evet, Mesa Community College, Arizona State, Grand Canyon. There's so many people who are willing to partner with us to, to make our budget go further. And with that, I think the, and then the final thing has been mentioned tonight, transparency. And so thank you for the opportunity. And Dr. O'Reilly. A budget makes visible what we value. Every dollar we spend says what we think is important, and what we don't spend it on says where it's not important. We have a really big budget with a lot of money from a lot of different sources. Uh, my, we need to make sure all of those sources are aligned and we're spending the money on our priorities. My first big budget priority of, is students, of course. If we want to ensure appropriate class size, we want to ensure they have the support personnel, um, but we also want to make sure the classes have the resources that they need. I was talking to a teacher who said, you know, I'm teaching first grade, I'm using the same reading series I had when I was a first grader. Uh, now I know we're going through a reading adoption, but that's not giving classes the resources they need for the, the kind of education we want to have. I also would prioritize making transparency and clear communication about our budget decisions a priority. Now, I know people would rather have a root canal than read a budget document, but it's very important we communicate to our community and our employees about our spending. And finally, it may not sound like a budget priority, but it is. I would prioritize inviting our missing students back to our schools. We need to make sure we provide the options students need and parents want. We need to be offering the best opportunities and convincing people that that is uh, what we need to do. So those are my budget priorities. All right, so uh, for question number five, we're beginning with Mrs. Ellingson. Please share your thoughts on how to regain the learning losses due to the pandemic and school closures. 
Okay. Well, thank you. Um, so C.S. Lewis once said, you can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. I think that we've learned a lot. Hindsight is twenty twenty. We didn't, nobody had any, they couldn't ask any questions about COVID-19 because nobody had ever been through it before. I tell people it's kind of like you're building the airplane while you're flying it. And my hat goes out to those in the district who've been working so hard on this. Um, I think there's been some positives that have happened from COVID-19. I, I hear the word new normal, but I think we can take that challenge and say, look, we've made some changes and we roll with changes. And how about we make a better normal? How about we look at some of these things like hybrid has worked out well for some families or some people enjoy the AB day or a four day a week of school. Also now um, long term illness, you can check in if you have questions. But I, I still think that parents need good choices for their students. Good choices mean a better virtual curriculum. Maybe looking at strengthening MDLP, which we already have in place. Mesa also has its own TV channel. Maybe we could use that a little bit more. And also a better in-person option, going five days a week for those who want to go to school. As a parent, I weigh the risk for my children daily. Do I put them in a car? Do I let them ride a bike? Do I let them on their, on their skateboard? And I think that that's a good way we can do that. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Steiner. Thank you. Many of the candidates already have addressed many of the things I would say already, but I, I was uh, part of a, a virtual meeting this morning, and the topic was, how do you address learning loss? Um, and both um, Kathy Hoffman, Superintendent of Public Instruction, and um, Dr. Forlis were in this meeting. Both of them reiterated that we need to meet our students where they are. We, we want to make sure that we're pulling them up, not pushing them down. And so if we can meet them where they are, that gives us the opportunity to pull them with us and individualize that instruction to be able to help them find, to help assess and help them uh, move forward instead of starting where you think they should be and moving them backwards. So we wanna make sure that we're offering those choices and equity with that as well. I think also um, what Laura said about um, offering those, those, cho those different choices to our students, that we wanna make sure that they have options um, as we move forward out and beyond the pandemic. Um, so my big takeaways here are understanding our students, how to provide them with equal and equitable equitable opportunities to move forward, not move backwards. Thank you. And Mrs. Sears. I would actually like to approach this question a very different way. Um, as we look at learning loss, I think about what we know about coming back um, when we have the summer gap. So that's something we experience every single year. It's a shorter amount of time, but I think we've learned some things around, along the way. And I think those things need to be applied to where we currently are, because teachers have some experience with that. It's not totally a new frontier, but in doing that, one of the first things we assess when we look at how children are, um, where they're at and what's going on, the first thing is checking in. Social emotional learning and social emotional health and wellness with children is one of the things that our teachers um, assess every single day. And in, in all of the caring adults that are in our schools, whether it's support staff, whether it's the cafeteria workers, it takes all of that. So I think in this time, especially with COVID, that's one of the benefits of going back and being in school that students have a holistic approach. So I think it's more than just what's happening in the books, because if your mind is dealing with all the social emotional things, and we know the additional stressor, even if you're learning, those things may not be things that you can adapt and take in. So one of the things that goes on with learning losses in the summer has to do with that. So I think a holistic approach with it, not just if I can add two plus two. Thank, Thank you. you. And? Mr. Crandall. Thank you. Children are resilient. Uh, I've got 13 kids. Uh, some thrive in different environments, different ways. They're all different, that's for sure. 
but children are resilient. I'm not as worried about the learning loss from this six to nine month period as much as I am students who year after year are falling further behind. That's, to me, that's even a bigger issue. But, but the same approach should help. I really like Laura's uh, a better normal. I love that phrase. One of the things that I would do is we're a very large city. Uh, we're larger than Pittsburgh. We're larger than Miami Mesa is with 475,000 people. We have thousands of retired teachers. And right before the COVID hit, back in January, February, I was meeting with Kirk Thomas at Mesa High and Chris Gilmore, the principal at Westwood. And we were talking about creating a volunteer force of huge magnitude, two, three, 400 retired teachers who live in the Mesa boundaries. These are not necessarily Mesa retired teachers. They could be from Minnesota or Iowa or any place like that. We have thousands of teachers who would love to come in for a few hours a week. We, and we had vests made up with the logo Mesa High Volunteer. We had parking places, you know, little signs made to show what it would be like. That force still exists. Now we have to be a little careful with PPE and some of those things as we bring people back to campus over the next uh, couple of years. But we have resources that we've never brought to bear uh, for this learning loss that we have. And the learning loss is not just from COVID, but it's from other uh, kids not thriving in that environment. And then I go back to my same answer. We have to have options and flexibility to meet kids where they are. Thank you. Could you repeat the question, please? Absolutely, Dr. O'Reilly. Please share your thoughts on how to regain learning losses due to the, pa to the, the pandemic uh -huh. and school closures. I think the COVID, learning loss with COVID is our biggest equity challenge and biggest equity emergency. I think you're, uh, the microphone. That the learning loss due to COVID is the biggest emergency and equity emergency we've ever had in Mesa. We have students who are behind and now they've fallen even further behind. We've done online and remote learning. They didn't have computer, computers to, to come along. Some people didn't have uh, parents to, with them to could stay with them. So I think that's a really urgent loss. Uh, that is like an all hands on deck crisis as far as I'm concerned, that we need to address however we can in all the ways that we can. We have breaks, we have after school, we've got summer. We have money we saved that we can spend on one-to-one -one instruction and, and interventions. So um, those are some of the things I think we need to do. And we need to say, to get students to the high level of performance that we want, we need to bring them up. And we need to do that in, with every resource that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Johnson. I feel very fortunate that we're in Mesa and that we have the resilient teachers that we have because I think that that has given us a huge opportunity. We've seen our teachers do incredible things over the last seven months. They turned on a dime in March and took on the challenge with what they had. There wasn't a lot of, t there was no time almost. Um, and, and they figured it out uh, enough to, to get through the year. And I won't say that that was perfect, but they did everything that they could last on the fourth quarter. And I admire that. And coming into the first quarter of this year, they were able to adapt over the summer, which is typically their time off, um, learn new programs, invest in the, in the new technologies, uh, change things, teach parents how to help their kids and support where they could. So I'm very confident in our teachers that we'll be able to make up the loss that they had. I feel like this first quarter has gone at a slower pace than what would typically happen in a school year. Uh, but that gave the kids the ability to to learn at the in the in the odd environment that they're in and i think that the teachers with as resilient as they have been so far will be able to make up some of those losses through the second through fourth quarters to help build that back before the year ends thank you on to question number six where we're starting with mrs steiner partnerships are increasingly important to the success of the district what role would you play in building meaningful community partnerships? You are absolutely right. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to stop by and visit with parents at Longfellow Elementary. Um, and they had a City of Mesa sponsored event going on where the department, the, um, the fire department, along with um, uh, the medical, oh, all of a sudden I lost the name, uh, the Mesa Vista um, Medical Centers, they offered free COVID testing and they also offered free f flu shots. Also, we have a partnership with Amazon that donates 
many goods um, that they can't sell anymore. I've seen that in action. I think we have so many different partners, partnerships and I think it's so valuable to Mesa schools. We have a long history of community partnerships. Um, not only with the city of Mesa, but one of the, one of the favorite things of my students uh, as a principal was Thursdays because we had um, deliveries from um, of food. Oh, darn it, all of a sudden my mind went blank. <laughs> it's a nonprofit organization. And my kids, was, the students would stop by my office with their bag food. Um, brain food, it's brain food. And they would say this is the best day of the week because they would have food for the weekend. So we have a lot of partnerships that are going on in Mesa and they are so valuable and we need to have them not only for fiscal and financial, but for the well-being of our students. Thank you. Mrs. Sears. Partnerships, and to me, all I hear is relationships. Relationship building is what we do. We are a community that operates very much like a family in so many different things. So the, it's expanding on those partnerships, especially in the area of innovation and technology, making sure that our students have those internships, have those externships, the opportunity to be exposed to different areas that's going to allow them to have those high paying jobs and be part of the successful uh, leaders in the future. But the other part is, knowing each child by their strength. That's how we actually look out in the community and say, where do we need help? Where do we need support? Who has it? Who is willing to give it? Because people are very generous and this is how we expand those dollars. This is how we unite. This is how we grow by not just looking to within our walls, but going out. And as we mentioned, the city of Mesa, I am and will continue to be that champion for the city of Mesa that they make sure that the city of Mesa becomes the first city in the Southwest to be a Wi-Fi city. Then we won't have this disparity with children not having Wi-Fi, not having connectivity. Even if the cost is low, family sometimes don't have the wiring to be able to do it. So the city and a relationship with Mesa Public Schools, we will do it, we can do it, and I will be a champion to continue pushing our city. So thank, thank you. you for the opportunity. Uh, Mr. Crandall. Beth, I think we need to be strategic about our partnerships. Partnerships need to be used to expand what works in Mesa. We all know this and, and we've heard it forever. Kids in the fine arts do better in school. Kids in athletics do better in school. Kids who are involved, my own personal experience, kids who are in, are in JROTC, kids who attend EVIT, who do CTE. So the question is, what strategic partnerships exist that will help us to expand those programs that work? Let's take the fine arts, for example. What's our partnership with Gamage and ASU? What's our partnership with this incredible uh, Mesa Arts facility that we have right now? What are we doing there? When it comes to CTE, what are our partnerships with our, our uh, manufacturers, with Boeing, with engineering firms, TR, uh, some of those activities that we have going on? So as we look at partnerships, I'm going to say, okay, what does that bring to the table? Does that expand a program that already works, or are we having to bring more resources just to get it started? There's incredible opportunities. And one thing important to remember is that partnerships are not just external. We need to look, when I had that conversation with the superintendent about her vision for Mesa, one of the things she told me about is the idea that elementary schools would work with middle schools that would work with high schools. And you would see a continuum. And the one area that she was talking about was dual language. We have kids who have dual language immersion at Hermosa Vista, but then it stops at Stapley and Mountain View. How do we have that continuum as a partnership all the way K-12 and then into college? So we need to look at partnerships externally and internally. Thank you. So you asked, what, what can we do as board members to, to promote partnerships? I think our active involvement uh, in partnership development, I think partnership development is everyone's responsibility in Mesa, not just, just one person's. We have community contacts. So we have contacts in education groups, at the universities, with businesses. That is, the district has a need we can call on those. Or as they have ideas and they have a need of what they want to do, we can connect the, the district to those contacts. Uh, as we hear about opportunities, we can represent the district and, and bring people along so that they choose Mesa as their partner, not another district. When we bring in partners, having a board member there tells them, we think your project is important. 
And so I think the board are ambassadors or representatives who's, who say Mesa thinks you're, you're, what you're doing is important. And I think what we need to do is support the various partnerships. And a good example is the Arizona Brain Food. It started when a mother in Mesa, Ruth Collins, said, hey, I've just, there are people out here who are coming to school hungry on Monday. We need to do something about that. She started the backpacks with a couple hundred kids and started at Mesa schools. Now there, Mesa, then she came to Mesa and said, we need some more resources. Mesa provided them, and now they're serving 3,600 students. So helping our existing partnerships do better is also a role the board members can play. Mrs. Johnson. I think that the partnerships that we have are fantastic and that we do need to continue to build them. Part of my current job is building relationships with people and telling them what our needs are and finding out how we can help their needs. And so I feel like that that would come very naturally to me to be able to reach out. I think a lot of times there's companies that want to help out, even if it's not directly in line with what their business generally does, but they don't know what is needed and just being able to be available and not be afraid to tell them, hey, this is what we're looking for. Are you interested in helping us? And not being afraid of getting that no goes a long way. So I think that it's, it's important that we serve the relationships that we currently have and that we don't just take those for granted, but that when it goes to asking is not being afraid to ask somebody for something that's a little bit outside of what their normal wheelhouse may be as well. Thank you. Mrs. Ellingson. Thank you. We have a great community. We have a community who loves and who serves, and I think love and compassion can go a long way. It doesn't have to be big to be com community involvement. I know that churches have donated sanitary items to fifth and sixth grade girls who are in need of that. I know that they've participated in cleanups. I think that we can level that playing field by coming together. I would love, I'm a list person, I've mentioned that before, but I, I would love to see teachers adding to the Mesa Public Schools website, this is where I need help. And anybody in the community can take that challenge and come help, read with a student, or, um, or anything like that. I, we also have justserve.org that we could participate and use. That's a good thing that we can use and add to. I've been talking with different city council members and city employees who've told about there's a new education strategy program rolling out in January, and it connects students with businesses for paid internship positions, CTE, and things like that. Involving the students in the Mesa community is a, is a great way to bring businesses together and to help those students be able to feel successful and then we're getting them to be career and college ready that way by working with the great businesses that we have in Mesa. Also, we have, we have great programs to work with like the Mesa Public Schools Foundation. They're a charity who gives so much back to our community and maybe helping grow and strengthen that. Thank you. Excellent. For question number seven, uh, we are starting with Mrs. Sears. Please discuss any policy or procedural changes you believe would help ensure school safety. When I look at uh, school safety, one of the things that I remember is we've um, looked at where we align our money and what's happening. Policies that empower our students. Because school safety begins with knowing what's happening. And the first people who actually know what's going on in our schools is our students. And I think we've done a lot of things to make sure we have plexiglass and things, shattered proof glass or what you want to call it. But it's about having an environment in which we actually have more social and emotional wellness and students feel more stability and confidence. That's where policies should actually start because then students could actually reach out and actually be the first responders to some of the things. People say onus and responsibility starts with the adults, but we know we most times within our schools, our students are very aware of what's going on. So that policy should be written around what we're doing with social emotional uh, learning and the plea for our students to actually have more counselors. And we understand that has to do with the funding model. It has to do with the, th the restrictions we have, but having more policies that support students to have that courageousness, but also have the social emotional wellness to be confident to help us with this challenge. Thank you. Mr. Crandall. 
the opportunity not too long ago to to tour one of the newest high schools in Utah. And this school was built with with sa school safety in mind. Uh, lots of, of open spaces, glass windows, uh, doors that shut automatically at the sound of a gunshot, uh, cameras that read license plates as they came in and out. And I thought to myself, this is the equivalent of having the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. Uh, when it comes to school safety, it's all about identifying issues before they come become issues. I had the opportunity to serve as the director of education for the state of Wyoming. And Wyoming did some some things. Now, keep in mind, Wyoming is it's 48 school districts. Most of them are quite small, so they can't afford a full-time SRO. So they've got to be creative in what they do. And one of the things that Wyoming did is there was an app that all the students had access to. And this app, very much similar to what Keanu, Keanu was talking about, students do know first. They know well before anything else of what's going to be an issue. And students anonymously could use this app, and it went straight to the, uh, the Wyoming Department of Public Safety. And they would determine the... Uh, the validity of it and they would they would take action you combine that app with a, a greater proportion of counselors to students not arizona's 900 to 1 not mesa's 450 500 to 1 but something even better than that put your dollars where it matters and really start to identify issues before they bubble up to the surface and when you have to worry about cameras and gunshot uh, microphones and things like that and so as a board member i'd push for those types of policies thank you Wonderful. When you think about school safety, most people think about uh, external threats. And Al Moore, our director of security, has done a great job. Are you on? Al Moore has done a great job of um, taking care of that, training people, getting funding for the schools, partnering with the police agencies. So I don't think we need any changes in that area in terms of policies and practices. But as we roll out COVID, that's another area of safety. And I think we're going to learn as we bring students back what policies and changes are needed. So I think that's an area where I can't predict what we'll need, but it, uh, it is something that I think we'll, as a board, we're gonna have to keep, be looking at. There are a lot of other things we'll need to address, and as a board member, we'll check to see that we have the right policies, things like bullying, um, things like cyber threats, now that we've given all students, including elementary students, computers. Uh, now that drug overdoses and things like that, as, and intervening with students who may be thinking about suicide, all major threats. But safety is more than fences and Lysol wipes. It's what's going on in the classroom. And there's a, this month's Atlantic Magazine, there's a profile of Judith Harper, a Westwood teacher, who is, is great. And she says, she builds a strong sense of community so students feel safe to take risks. So we need to think about safety globally. And we need to think about not just building fences, but building community. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Johnson. I, Mr. or Dr. O'Reilly addressed a little bit of what I was going to discuss, that I think internet safety right now is a big factor. We just introduced a lot of computers and we haven't had time to change the curriculum to make sure that computer safety and appropriateness has been discussed at all levels of school. It's generally a class that's taken right before seventh grade or during seventh grade, and that's going to need to be adjusted. And we're gonna to need to be able to find a way to make sure that kids are safe with it and also bring awareness to the parents that aren't as computer literate of what their kids may end up being exposed to. Even with the best protections on a computer, kids use VPNs and they get around things and they're one step ahead most of the time than we are. <laughs> so um, they're just faster with it and it's native to them. It's it's like their first language to, to use laptops and, and internet. So it's making sure that we put the proper protections in place that we can try to block it, but then that we also are able to catch it when it happens. We wanna be more proactive, but at times you'll need to have that those reactive abilities to look at what they've used and make sure that they're aware that we're able to look at everything that they're doing on those computers. I think um, I agree with Dr. O'Reilly as well that physical physical safety has been, I think we're at about the max of what we can do with that. And so we just need to make sure that we're staying aware. The only other thing that I can think of would be putting more cameras on, on the campuses. Um, but we even have that on most campuses now. So thank you. Thank you. And Mrs. Ellingson. Great, thank you. The hard part about going fifth is that a lot of things are said that I completely agree with. Um, I think that safety, we have, we have spent millions of dollars on fences and PPE, and yet we hand our students these laptops. We hand five-year-olds laptops that do not have the filters that I would want on my children's laptops. 
uh, we have Gilbert Public Schools who I know I have friends there that if a child even looks up the word suicide or um, pornography or things like that, that um, the administrators flagged and then the parents are, are made aware. I have a friend whose sixth grader received a porno pornographic pop-up during one of his WebExes. So why are, you know, our filters need to be stronger. Also, um, safety in suicide. I didn't realize, but the leading cause of death in Arizona for 10 to 14 year olds right now is suicide. So I believe that our teachers need some training. I think that they need training and how, what signs to look for. As a teacher myself, I would love to have that kind of training to know how to work with our students. Also bullies are dangerous, but an engaged bully, someone who has something to look forward to and to be engaged in, is not as big of a behavior threat. So again, that goes with meeting the individual child and what their needs are and helping them be productive and busy so that they're not a threat. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Steiner. Well, going sixth is even <laughs> more challenging, I should say. <laughs> Everybody said pretty much everything. I do think we need to be proactive in looking at the variety of um, issues that we face coming back from this um, pandemic. I do agree with the having the counselors. I think we are seeing um, increased bullying. The cybersecurity still needs to be there. I don't know what policies and procedures are, are in place. That would take some study and some look in, looking into. But I think it's more than just the COVID. Safety is more than just the COVID. Um, Laura talked about suicide training, which I think is a huge piece. When I was a principal, I had a fourth grader take his own life. It was a really, really tough time. Um, and I wished I had had more training um, to, so that I would have seen that because I had seen him the week before in my office. So there's so many things that we need to have safeguards in place um, to help keep our kids safe. We, we put all the safeguards in place when we had all these school, school shootings. Now we're putting all the safeguards in place um, for COVID-19. We have to take it a step farther and be proactive in, in really figuring out what other safety issues and measures do we need to look at in order to have policies and procedures to help our students stay safe in school. Thanks. For our final question, we're starting with Mr. Crandall. Please share your final thoughts about your candidacy for the governing board opportunity it's been a pleasure to be here tonight and to hear the opinions and the ideas of these board members i would be honored to serve with any of them probably the greatest challenge that we have right now is that we've got to figure out how to meet kids where they are and i've said that a few times tonight i look forward to having been on the board in 2005 2008 i know that mesa has the talent we have the people we have the resources to be one of the top performing districts in the country. There are some things that we need to look at that we need to do differently. We can't be so traditional. We can't be so timid. We need to be able to move quickly. Uh, things come, opportunities become, opportunities come very quickly uh, for us to take advantage of. Can we pivot fast enough to take advantage of those? I appreciate so much the opportunity uh, to be endorsed uh, by the Mesa Chamber of Commerce because business, the city of Mesa and the Mesa School District all go hand in hand. And I look forward to pushing forward with that momentum as we, uh, as we move forward. Uh, and with that, once again, I thank you for the time tonight. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Dr. O'Reilly. I think you need to think about the five board members as a band. And you don't want five bass guitars. You want groups that are, you want people who are all playing the same song, but each contributes a different sound. I can play a unique role in our band of board members. I've got a great deal of experience with achievement data, with metrics and budgets. And as a student once told me when I was talking to his class about using math in your job, you actually like this stuff. And I do. Um, I should say, although I'm frequently thought of as a numbers guy, what really gets me is the, the students behind the numbers, the teachers, the students, the families. That's what I'm, the numbers represent and I pay attention to. Um, my experience in research and policy analysis will help inform the board's decisions. Uh, you know, I, I also am focused on how do we communicate our financial data so that we can improve our, the trust that people have in the district and the decisions we make. Additionally, I'll be a strong ambassador for Mesa Schools. I have a lot of connections with policymakers, with community partners, with post-secondary colleagues. Uh, with all of those groups, I'll continue to build bridges that I think will benefit Mesa and our students. My work style is collaborative and focused. 
I, I carefully consider the perspectives of our, our community and staff members, and I do my homework. So uh, that is that is what I'm, I'll bring to the board, and that is uh, why I'm running for the board. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Johnson. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have been here this evening. This has been a wonderful experience. I. I think one of our challenges as a district is getting the entire community involved. And a lot of times you'll hear people say that only a certain voice comes to the meetings and speaks up. I'm bilingual and I'm able to help bring in other parts of our community and make them feel welcome. It's not that they're not able to come, but it's, it's making sure that they feel like they're welcome and that their voice is gonna be heard and that they're comfortable speaking to us. And I would be able to help provide a little bit of a bridge in those areas, go out to those parts of the community and let them know that we wanna hear what they, what they have to say as well, and that we want everybody com, uh, to be a part of that conversation. So my goal is to work collaboratively across the entire district to make sure that every, every family's voice is heard. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Ellingson. Well, while I'm involved in a political campaign right now, when you see the name Laura Salmon Ellingson on your ballot, I want you to think like me. She's a parent. She's a teacher. She loves Mesa. I want you to know that I will work my hardest and do what it takes to give the children of Mesa a great education and to work with Mesa Public Schools. I'm honest. I'm going to do what I say I'm going to do, and I have no ulterior motives. I'm doing this because I want the children of Mesa to succeed. Every decision I make, on the school board, I will filter through, is this good for students? And if it's not, I will vote no. I think that education is the ticket to a better life, and we want a good, strong public education system in Mesa because it lifts us all. When our children are educated, we're all better for it. And I'm so thankful that you had me here tonight, and Chris, you've done a great job, so thank you very much for having me. Mrs. Steiner. I think uh, involving constituents, seeking the inputs and the perspective of others from, from throughout the communities. I know that in, in Mesa Public Schools, we have a very bright future ahead of us. We can carry on those traditions, the values and the ethics that have been in place since the inception of our district. Collaboration, clear communication, clarity, consistency, and transparency across the district with parents, teachers, business partners, and the community will help us to rebuild some trust that we've lost. Joe O'Reilly mentioned that earlier. Um, we can begin to build those bridges to have a brighter future for Mesa. Um, we need to focus on some of the policy initiatives and make sure that our actions are aimed at forward movement and what is best for kids. And Laura focused on that as well. I offer fresh perspective and insight focused on forward movement, innovation, and inclusivity. I think rebuilding that trust with that clear communication and transparency coupled with collective commitments from board members will help us to, to have that move forward. But we also wanna make sure we have the commitment to high achievement for our students, for our teachers, and for the district as a focus as we move forward. I have a few more a few more seconds. <laughs> so I really do understand the dynamics of Mesa's diverse communities. And I look forward to engaging in that decision-making process with the other boards amid those challenges and the ever-changing dynamics of Mesa Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Mrs. Sears. Thank you so much for that opportunity. Uh, there you go. Thank you so much for the opportunity tonight. And I want to continue to do the things I've um, talked about when I first started my campaign in 2016 and was elected to the governing board. One, looking at our community and seeing that we're all able to define the odds and actually defy the odds and continue to have grit, resiliency, success, no matter where you come from, no matter if you live on the east side or the west side. I live in Los Angeles and doing that, people say, wow, I always see you on the west side because the bridging the gap and having all students being represented has always been my call because I love people and I'm excited about the future. When I see little children succeed and all children, that's the Mesa that I moved to. 
I chose 26 years ago, and I'm very proud to commit my time, my talent, my dedication to making sure that every kid get a quality education because every child deserves to learn and to be successful. So I ask the people of Mesa to continue supporting me, everyone in our district, because I know we're in five legislative districts. Please go to www.searsforMPS.com. Thank you. Thank you. And this concludes our forum. Thank you so much to our panelists for their participation. Once again, my name is Chrissy Lenz, and we appreciate you joining us this evening. We will now display a slide with candidate contact information for any community members who have follow-up questions for our candidates. The slide will stay on screen for two minutes. And as a reminder, election day is November 3rd. Thank you and have a great evening.